So as you can see, the title of my talk is The Problem of the Painter in Alba Baird's Loop. And you might be thinking, well, what is that problem? It's going to take us a minute to get there. We need some context before we know quite what this problem is. So just a little bit about who this guy is, Alban Berg, a 20th century Austrian composer, part of uh, the inf famous or infamous uh, Arnold Schoenberg circle. One of his students, in fact, he looked like Oscar Wilde as a young man and Christopher Walken as a middle-aged man. <laughs> um, and that's a painting of him actually by Arnold Schoenberg, by his teacher. He dabbled in the visual arts as well. And the opera, uh, it's an opera in three acts, more or less. I was composed, it's really one of his last works, he died in 1935, um, and it was composed between 1929 and 1935, based upon two plays by Frank Wedekind, who serendipitously also wrote Spring Awakening, which our theater department is staging this weekend and last weekend. This is a total coincidence, but please go see that as well. Um, and I saw it last weekend. It's delightful and subversive and lots of wonderful things. Um, it was completed in short score, but it was actually left unfinished at the time of his death. He had written most of the notes, but he hadn't really orchestrated it yet. So that was a problem, of course. Um, so when it was premiered, which was itself a subversive act, keep in mind there's the rise of the fascist governments in Central Europe, it was premiered in Switzerland, that tells you something. Um, it was premiered in an incomplete two-act version at the time, and it wasn't premiered in a three-act version until 1979. Why so late? Well, because his wife actually outlived him by about 41 years, and consequently she would not let anyone uh, near his manuscripts, so it was, finally it was finally completed after she died. Uh, so that's why it took so long to do that, and someone else orchestrated the third act. Again, most of the notes were written, but um, we didn't know who was supposed to play which instrument. So. It's, there's a lot of plot in this. I said it was based on two plays, and Berg actually wrote the libretto himself and had to reduce the text enormously, so it's only 20% of the text of two different plays. So this is a comical oversimplification of what happens. Uh, but in the first half, it basically chronicles Lulu's ascent through the so up the socioeconomic ladder by marrying a series of men of increasing stature and wealth and power. Her first husband is a doctor, referred to as the medic medicine specialist, and uh, he's much older than her and dies uh, a rather sudden death when he sees her uh, cheating on him with a painter, uh, who ends up becoming her second husband, and he becomes rather wealthy and powerful himself. Uh, but she's not married to him for too terribly long either, because he kills himself when he finds out that she's been cheating on him with... Uh, Dr. Ludwig Schirm, her sometime guardian. Really, she was his ward at some point. The exact nature of their relationship is not entirely clear. It's sort of shrouded in myth. Uh, and that's the first half. And you guessed it. Well, the first one died, the second one died. Believe it or not, uh, the third one also did, and this time by Lulu's hand. He actually handed her a gun and told her to kill, her, kill herself. Uh, she refused and shot him instead five times. Um, and because she became a murderess, she then, in part two, uh, it becomes a fugitive. So she has to flee, she's in prison for a while, has this elaborate scheme to escape prison, which is just preposterous. Uh, but she gets out eventually, is in Paris for a while, and eventually ends up in London, uh, surrounded by a small circle of admirers and she resorts to prostitution to make a living, to support her and her admirers. And adding a nice symmetry to the opera, uh, she has three clients her first day as a prostitute, and last, by the way. Um, her first husband, the actor who played her first husband, comes back as her first client, who is a professor, who is actually silent. Her second husband, the actor who played him, the painter, comes back as a character simply called a Negro. Um, and that's, by the way, the problem. And we'll get back to that in just a moment, but before we need to know how it ends, now don't we? Um, her third husband, uh, who is supposedly the, man she, the only man she ever truly loved, comes back as her third client, and why were we in London? Well, that's where Jack the Ripper was. So Jack the Ripper, you know what he liked to do with prostitutes, so that was Lulu's decline. All right, so these are the problems we need to get to. So I want to show you a little bit of this. Why this is problematic.
So the part where it's paused, you might be able to see that uh, his skin tone is a little bit different on his neck uh, than it is on his face. And I'll show you a picture of that actor um, in just a moment here. So what is the problem? This is, um, so what is this problem? Okay, and here's a, another, uh, another actor playing that same part. Here it's made a little bit more clear. Uh, so first of all, the character is a walking caricature. In fact, a walking stereotype as it is. Uh, he speaks with poor grammar, uh, he's violent, he's a drunkard, he basically has very few redeeming qualities, um, and since the opera world is not especially diverse, this character has almost historically at least been performed in blackface. So, the question is, well, what do we do about this if we want to, if we prefer to have a more sensitive and politically correct staging? Um, and I should say that this picture was taken as recently as 2013. This is from the Welsh National Opera in 2013, not 03, not, not 1973, but 2013, um, and the video I just showed you was from 2010. So far as I'm aware, no North American opera companies have done it in blackface recently, and I'll tell you um, what they've done. So what is the solution? Well, I suppose the most obvious solution ought to be uh, to simply cast a black actor in the role, which uh, again would seem sort of like a no-brainer, and that I think is probably the most uh, really just the most logical course of action here, and one might ask, well, why hasn't this been done more? Well, as I mentioned before, the, the world of opera isn't especially diverse, and it's hard to cast this show as it is. You have to be exactly the right voice type, and you have to want to sing this, this difficult 20th century idiom, and um, I imagine that they may have trouble finding anyone to sing the role, um, and having an additional restriction on that might be difficult, and uh, also, you know, uh, it may be hard to convince someone of color to, to do this role because the, the role isn't exactly redeeming. It's not exactly a positive light. And, I, and there's debate as to whether or not that would actually be a good thing. And so far as I'm aware, um, only one company has hired a black actor for the role. In 2012, a, a Belgian, opera, Belgian opera production. I think they're the only ones. I haven't found a picture of everyone yet but I'm trying to figure that out. But so far as I'm aware, they're the only company that has for this particular role. Um, there are some other solutions that opera, that opera companies have taken to. Oh, by the way, this is, this is the other guys who have typically played the role. It's an interesting gallery. That was the guy who we saw in blackface before, interestingly enough. Um, so what, another solution has been simply to skip the makeup and keep the character the same in every other way. And this seems to be the most common solution. This is what they've done at the Met the last two times, uh, and also some other European productions from the 90s. They've simply kept all the lines the same. He, the character has still mentioned that he's descended from an African king, um, but they've otherwise changed nothing. Uh, and this, again, seems to be the most common by far. Um, another solution, uh, sort of a life hack here, so then skipping the third act in which that happens. And that's not such a preposterous solution, um, not only because the opera is long enough, each, uh, each act takes more than, an, um, more than an hour to perform, and that means that if an opera company normally starts their operas at 8 o'clock, they usually start at 7, um, so it takes about four hours with intermission. Uh, so what they did at the first the first performance of it, at the premiere, the two-act premiere, well, they didn't just skip Act 3. There was a symphony that was excerpted from the opera. So they played that, and they just pantomimed the action of the third act. That way, you avoid having those lines set. So you can still have the second client come in and, and do his business with Lulu and then leave. So, um, so that's a, a perfectly reasonable solution, and some companies have done this. I believe they did that in Zurich a couple of years ago. And... Here's maybe my favorite of all, changing the character into a sailor. <laughs> the Chicago Lyric Opera did this in 2008. I was at the production and was really chuffed by this. Um, the character sings about having six wives, two English, two French, two Spanish. So the idea of having a girl or two, as it turns out, in each port, uh, I suppose makes, about, makes at least a reasonable amount of sense. So where do we go from here is the question. I'm trying to figure out what has been done. This is a relatively new project. Every time this has been staged, I've found out the names of just about everyone. There may be some productions I'm not aware of, but I want to know who's played the part and how has the character been rendered. And of course, from there, to be able to create a resource for opera companies, helping them to know what their options are to have uh, a more uh, politically savvy and, well, frankly, less offensive production. So these are, this is the project. Thanks very much.